We are now broadcasting. <clears throat> ah, yeah, there we go. Hi and welcome. We are slowly moving up. Let me just pop that. All right, so I'm going to get started here. Um, I'm Ronnie Brown. I'm with Couch and Eye Care. And I just want to welcome you all tonight to this webinar, Get Distant and Personal. Oops, that's not actually the webinar. <laughs> just hang on one sec. Uh, so welcome to tonight's webinar, Get Distant and Personal. It's Couch and Eye Care's first town hall. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. If you click on that, that'll bring up. You can ask any questions that you have and we'll try and address them throughout the webinar uh, and the doctors will hopefully address them themselves. Uh, we'll not be using any hand raising feature today. And you also see a live poll that will come up during the webinar. Um, and this is just a question that the doctor, doctors wanted to ask you. So you're welcome to answer and then we will put up the results at the end. Um, but thank you again. I'll now pass it over to Dr. Miranda. Thanks, Ronnie, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, you know, everybody's Zooming now, like uh, online, and uh, my kids are taking courses online. So we thought, hey, at Couch and I care, let's uh, let's join the uh, let's join the crowd and, and and do some education and dialogue online. It's really cool uh, with this format that we can interact with you uh, via questions. Uh, so feel free to ch use the chat box down below uh, to chat with us, uh, ask us questions, and and interact. Um, we're really, really pleased to have um, local celebrity and physician, Dr. Bill Molason here. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Bill, for joining us. Uh, he's going to talk to us a, a little bit about what's happening in the Couch and Valley with, with COVID-19, as well as uh, my partner, Dr. Anita Voison. Uh, uh, at Couch and Eye Care and what we're doing with our pandemic protection plan and how we're going to go forward with eye care in the Valley. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Bill Malason. Uh, he runs his, his clinic, uh, Shawnigan Family Practice in Shawnigan Lake. I've known Bill as a friend and uh, colleague, you know, for over 20 years and uh, what, a, what a jewel he is to the Couch and Valley and a great resource. So we thought we'd bring Dr. Malason here uh, to give us a rundown of how Couch and Valley is, is dealing with COVID-19 and how he as a, as a family doctor is uh, protecting you, the patient and, uh, and his team um, from uh, the virus. So uh, Bill, uh, feel free to add in uh, there, but without further ado, Dr. Malason, thank you. Yeah, thanks Trevor. Uh it's an absolute pleasure to be here and, uh, and welcome to all the, the folks that have logged in. So um, uh, yeah, as Trevor said, I, I've been uh, practicing in, in Shawnigan Village for the last 25 years and uh, been a pleasure to do that. Um, you know, the experience in the Couch and Valley with respect to COVID-19, um, as you all know, has been a, has a bit of a favorable for sure you know we look at the province uh, in over 2200 cases 121 deaths we've been uh, fortunate to have only about 124 cases on the island and and four deaths um so we're we've been relatively protected here so you had another good reason to live on vancouver island and in the couch and valley in particular um you know there's been a lot of uh, time and effort gone in to preparing the valley there's a lot of dedicated family doctors uh, that has spent a lot of time in behind the scenes planning. And some of that planning is uh, included preparing the hospital for the potential surge. Uh, we're, um, we've been, uh, the, the, uh, one of the first things that was done was uh, sort of canceling all elective surgeries. So we wanted to sort of make room in the hospital. So we had place for the potential surge patients of COVID to, to go into. Um, the, uh, there's a dedicated ward actually in the Couch and uh, District Hospital for COVID patients and there have been a few. Uh, we have had small numbers in the valley. Um, public health doesn't actually release the specific numbers. They kind of keep those close to the chest. Um, however, we have had some. 
so we've been prepared uh, in the hospital for, from that perspective. Um, Long-term care facilities have had a unique uh, uh, concern about COVID. Uh, and so those, uh, there's been a lot of planning as well going into that. Now about 70% of the deaths across the country have come from long-term care facilities. So that's a particularly uh, vulnerable population. Um, Dr. Stacey McDonald, who has been spearheading the planning and locking down the, our facilities uh, has done a tremendous job. But of course, you know, there's no, no uh, visitors are allowed to come in. Um, staff are meant to only be in one facility, so they're not uh, risking spread. And as well, the, um, uh, they've locked down as one physician looking after all of those uh, residents. Um, the other aspect is we have our own testing center. And that's located at the, in the parking lot, actually, at the Cowichan District Hospital. Um, and the testing sort of profile has changed uh, as this uh, pandemic has progressed. And the strategies have changed. The current strategy, though, is uh, one of uh, uh, testing as many people that have any symptom related to COVID. So that's a new change, uh, Dr. Henry announced. Um, so, you know, if you actually have any symptoms, you're, you can self-refer, actually. I'm going to give you a number. Uh, so if folks, folks want to maybe jot that down, I'll provide that in a sec. But the idea is more now, uh, not of mitigation, but of containment. And in, in doing so, it's testing as many people with symptoms, you know, uh, isolating them and then contact tracing. And that's the key to uh, containing the virus. Um, that number is one eight four four nine zero one eight four two two. So patients with symptoms can actually call that and uh, there and get an appointment for a swab. Um, the other thing we've done is created a respiratory assessment center, and that's also located in the parking lot at the Cash Industry Hospital. It's a busy place. Um, the purpose behind that is that that's a GP referral place. So if somebody calls me and they have respiratory symptoms that could be COVID, maybe not, and I really want to listen to their chest and check them out, we send them to the respiratory assessment center. And, and by that, you know, all of these patients are kind of contained in one, lo one location and um, it reduces those patients going to the family doctor and, and also reduces our PPE burn rate, uh, which is pretty critical too. So those are some of the key elements that are happening in the Couch and Valley to, uh, uh, that we've done to sort of prepare for a potential surge. Awesome, thanks, uh, Dr. Bill. Um, and, and how are you practicing yourself, uh, Dr. Malaysen, in terms of how you're treating patients? Or are you doing things uh, quite a bit differently uh, in your office? You want to talk a little bit about telehealth and, and what you're doing there? Sure. Yeah, um, certainly. Uh, I think one of the messages I'd like to get across to those listening is that uh, your family doctor's office is open. Um, so uh, they're there and ready. Uh, the staff are there uh, prepared to answer your calls to, to book you an appointment with the doctor. But yeah, it's certainly been a different way of practicing medicine. We're, you know, about 95% of what I'm doing every day is, is virtual. So I feel like I have a phone growing out of my ear or a video screen. We can do video chats. Occasionally we do bring some people in though and, and you know, that need to be examined, whether you know, breast lumps or abdominal pain, things that we have to physically bring people in. And when we do, we're just allowing one patient in at a time and we you know, uh, sterilize the, uh, the room and sanitize everything, all the surfaces. So that uh, just to keep uh, not only patients safe, uh, our staff safe, and the doctors as well. Um, but I, one of the concerns is that I, I don't know if people are not access, accessing the family doctor as of late. It's certainly the numbers we're seeing are down. And, you know, when I'm driving my car and I see the check engine light come on, I'm kind of, I'm not very mechanically inclined. I'm thinking, okay, what's the matter with my engine? Uh, much like folks at home that, you know, have a symptom, uh, I, I think it's important that, that you get that checked out, you know. Um, 
I, I think delaying uh, could, could be increasing morbidity, which is uh, pain and suffering. But there's also concern that there may be increases in mortality. And I say that because Dr. Henry yesterday in a briefing said that above the normal levels of deaths that we're seeing, you know, and there's an expected number of deaths in BC, uh, there were 170 excess deaths she referred to. And 110 of those were COVID related, uh, but 60, uh, they're not sure yet what they were uh, from, not COVID, but she surmised that perhaps, you know, indirectly, these 60 excess deaths occurred that were related to COVID, insofar as, you know, people delaying care, going to the emergency department, having an MI uh, or other symptoms and not getting the care they need. So uh, I, I think uh, it's okay to go to the emergency room. Uh, it is safe to do so. And certainly, um, it's, it's important to access your family doctor. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bella. You know, just as a note, um, had a patient, uh, we're seeing patients on an emergency basis as well at, at Cowich and Eye Care and uh, had a patient, monocular patient, had a previous retinal detachment, lost vision completely in the, in the right eye, came in in the left eye complaining of similar symptoms, but he waited six days. And uh, certainly the, the retina was tearing very close to the macula. Luckily, we got them into surgery right away. Uh, but again, that just speaks to the fact, you know, don't wait at the very least, touch base, and uh, uh, your physician, your practitioner can walk you through the symptoms and, and see how uh, much of an emergency it is and, and if it's, it's prudent to be seen in person and get the proper imaging and proper diagnostics and such. So uh, make sure you reach out. So that's a great point. Um, I want to transition to um, what we're doing at Couch and Eye Care uh, with uh, my partner, Dr. Anita Voison. Uh, Anita's practiced uh, uh, in the Couch and Valley for over 20 years, um, and uh, she's just full of uh, amazing uh, information. She's really techie, and uh, she just loves these uh, luminars. So, uh, Anita, I'm just going to hand it over to you and uh, talk about uh, what we're doing at Couch and Eye Care uh, during the pandemic. Uh, era. Sure. Yeah. I'm just going to share my screen because I've got a little bit of a Okay. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see my screen? I do. I see it. Yeah, we can see your screen. <laughs> it's like, "Oh no, now I lost microphone." <laughs> I was muted. Yes, we can see you. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So as Trevor said, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our pandemic protection plan, which is sort of basically is what measures, you know, are we taking at Cowich and I care um, at the office currently while during our emergency care. And of course, when we reopen to routine care as well, um, which will hopefully be soon, but uh, we'll, we'll learn more on Wednesday, I, I hear. Um, so the first thing that we had to kind of consider is, you know, how do we, you know, how can we safely provide routine care? Uh, because, you know, the hard truth is we certainly cannot eliminate the risk of contracting COVID-19. Um, but, you know, our goal is to, you know, significantly reduce the risk and take special measures to do that. What this means, though, is that, you know, the routine eye examination that you're, you've, you've been used to having might look a little bit different uh, than it has in the past. Um, but you know, we do need to make changes to make things as safe as possible for everybody. So I'm gonna talk about sort of like five main things that we're doing here to help better provide uh, safe care. So the first one is um, screening patients. So, you know, all patients are going to be asked about, you know, uh, their symptoms, which I'm sure most of you guys, you know, the primary symptoms, coughing, fever, shortness of breath, um, a few others, of course. Um, travel, you know, have you traveled in the last 14 days? Um, and exposure, have you been in contact with somebody with COVID-19 or do you have COVID-19? So, you know, any patients that do have an active infection or if you meet that self-isolation criteria, um, we're, we won't be seeing uh, those patients in the office for routine exams. Um, if a person needs emergency eye care, uh, we can still uh, provide that via telehealth um, or refer uh, that patient to the appropriate care center um, to, to get the care that they need. 
Dr. Voisin, I'm just going to interrupt for a quick second. Just uh, just some feedback. If you can just project a little bit louder or closer to your sure. microphone. Sure. Yeah, and just uh, yeah, a little louder, and uh, that'll help. Thank you. Absolutely. No. Wow. I've I've I'm usually accused of talking too loudly. So, <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Uh, and then, of course, we would consider continuing to delay routine exams for at-risk patients. So the, you know, the, the very elderly, uh, immune compromised, um, you know, things like that. Hey, maybe we're going to wait a little while to bring those patients still back in for just routine uh, annual checkups. The next uh, protocol that we're going to um, uh, look at is physical distancing because of course this has been shown to be basically the one of the most effective ways of stopping the spread uh, and we're going to start that by trying to limit the number of people in the clinic so spreading out our appointments by booking less patients per hour. We intend on sort of having extended office hours um, with kind of two different shifts um, so that we can still try to see more patients throughout the day, but spreading them out. Uh, and then of course, we're going to, uh, you know, we're not gonna be looking for people to dro just drop by the office as much anymore. We're really gonna encourage uh, patients to only come into the office by appointment. Um, so even if you need a repair or an adjustment, uh, we're gonna prefer that patients call and arrange a time to come in. Um, and then of course, we have the option to ship products um, directly to people's homes um, so they don't have to come into the clinic to pick those up. Other ways that we can limit the number of people is, um, you know, when a patient does come in for an eye exam, we don't want them to bring the whole family with them. So we're asking people to come to the appointment by themselves or with one other caregiver. If they do, if you do need someone to come with you, like a translator or somebody that needs a caregiver, uh, of course you can bring them. Uh, but for the most part, we would prefer people to come by themselves. Um, and again, filtering through patients uh, to teleoptometry if possible. Uh, and of course, um, also reducing the number of staff in the office um, and making sure that they're taking their staggered lunch breaks and things like that to keep them physically distanced from one another. Uh, and then of course, I'm sure we've all seen signs like this. Um, so we're gonna probably have directional signs in our office as well, uh, you know, to make sure that um, people are trying to keep that safe two meter distance. Um, so they'll be kind of like uh, office, we're designing an office flow uh, to try to um, maintain separation. Uh, we've probably, uh, we might not even have waiting room chairs, but if we do, they're gonna be uh, a lot more distance in between them. Uh, and of course, asking people, trying not to touch things that you don't need to. Um, the third thing that we look at is reducing the time in the clinic. So reduce the risk of exposure by reducing the time that you are actually physically present. Um, so one of the things that we're moving to um, is electronic forms. So your consent forms, your health questionnaires, things like that are actually gonna be emailed to you and can be filled out and signed electronically. And we're going to ask people to try to give us as much detail as possible on any problems that they're having, because again, that will reduce the time in the clinic that is spent in trying to um, uh, ascertain what your problem is. Uh, when people arrive uh, at the office, um, we're going to have them call or text the office. So not to just walk in, but call or text us to tell us that you've arrived. And then we'll call or text you back when we're ready for you to come in. And then we can take you right back in to start your appointment instead of having, so basically the waiting room becomes your car instead of the waiting room in the office. Um, and then, of course, if there is any further history taking or confirmation information, even the payments and things like that, um, we'll try to do that over the phone uh, instead of in the clinic. Um, this is one of the biggest things that uh, is going to probably be difficult for us, uh, but we're really looking at sort of less socialization uh, with, with doctors and staff. So we you know, are going to try to minimize talking, um, especially in the duration of the exam and when we're doing our tech testing because we're very in close quarters. Um, so you're going to see that maybe we're a little bit more brief um, with the visits um, to, to minimize that. Um, you know, we do have the option of great video education tools, 
Um, we can also potentially uh, follow up with a phone call to the patient after the exam uh, to discuss the exam results if we've got something more detailed that we need to discuss with someone. And then we do also have access to an online patient portal um, where people can access their prescriptions and their invoices and everything online. So we don't have to print the piece of paper for you in the office. Uh, you can just access it electronically anytime at home. And then the, the last way that we're looking at reducing time in the clinic, we've already alluded to this, um, is telemedicine and telehealth. Um, so we do have the ability, we've been using um, telemedicine via our Care One portal uh, for quite a number of years uh, for consults with ophthalmology. And um, it's a very robust platform where we can share all the high tech scans and photographs that we've taken of the eye uh, and the ophthalmologist can view that directly as well as all of our exam findings. And it's really, really helped us even just even up until now um, has really helped us with um, reducing the need for patients to travel down to Victoria and things like that. Uh, so not only is it going to be more convenient for our patients timing wise still, but from a risk standpoint as well, um, that we can get a consult uh, remotely with the ophthalmologist. And then we can also still do our own uh, follow-up care um, virtually. Uh, so for, to follow up instead of coming back into the office for a second visit, if we can do it virtually, we'll do that via um, teleoptometry as well. Uh, next step would be sanitization. Um, so big things here are hand washing and remembering not to touch your face. Um, those are really key uh, important points. So basically, Anybody coming into the office, we're going to have them either wash their hands right away or use alcohol sanitizer. Um, all the doctors and staff, of course, are washing their hands very frequently throughout the day um, and during the examination. Um, the, and of course, as Dr. Malazan had mentioned, you know, all the equipment and the entire exam room surface is, is really thoroughly disinfected after each patient. This is occurring you know, before the patient walks into the room now. So basically when, when we're walking into the, the room, it has been thoroughly sanitized um, prior to the appointment starting. Um, and again, try not to, try not to be touching anything. Um, uh, you know, if for things, if we do need someone to sign something with a pen or if we're using the credit card terminal, that's gonna be like disinfected right after, you know, all those high traffic things, um, countertops, doorknobs, chairs, you know, our computers, phones, you know, that's being sanitized regularly throughout the day. And then we're trying to um, have sort of dedicated workstations for the staff so that they're not sharing computers and they're not sharing phones as much to reduce the risk of contamination amongst ourselves. Um, the next step with sanitization for us is, you know, uh, people like to try on glasses. Um, so we're going to, uh, we've, we're investing in UVC sterilization units, um, or we can also wash with warm soapy water. Soap is very effective against the coronavirus. Um, but we are making the investment in, the, in our little UVC ovens. Um, so uh, we'll be able to disinfect the frames and sanitize them uh, after they've been uh, tried on. Uh, we're also going to encourage that the staff are actually, you know, pulling frames and, and trying them on, like, so we don't have people just, you know, all over in the eyewear gallery. Um, we're sort of going to try to monitor that more and have the staff um, helping, we, we'll, we call it white glove service uh, for our patients. Um, and then, of course, getting rid of magazines and things like that, that can be touched by many people. And asking people to leave things that you don't need in the car, like don't bring in your coffee, don't bring in your uh, you know, large bags or anything like that, that uh, could be contaminated. Uh, and then we've got our personal protective equipment. So, um, so we've got uh, the doctors and staff will, of course, be wearing masks, gloves, and eye protection as required. Um, we're also switching to the use of office scrubs to make things a little bit easier for us um, so that we can change uh, out of the office scrubs uh, before we get home, wash them right away. Um, and um, the, uh, so there's, there's Trevor uh, modeling some scrubs and some uh, cool, cool uh, uh, goggles. Uh, and then the, um, 
Uh, we've got our face shields for our tax, which provides a little bit more protection. Uh, and then the doctors will probably be, so the doctors will wear the goggles or this eye shields like I am there uh, with our masks and gloves. Uh, the other way for personal protective equipment, um, you know, we're, we're going to request that patients also wear masks and we will have them at, you know, we will be able to provide that to the patient um, if needed. Uh, we are going to provide patients with uh, a specialized antiseptic wipe that they can use to clean their eyes when they go home. And then we are installing, I'm sure you guys have seen these things at the grocery stores and whatnot, but um, at the desks, we'll be installing the plexiglass shields. Um, and also for our equipment, like our slit lamp microscope, where we get very, very close, um, we're putting in and using uh, breath shields. Um, uh, to uh, to help this the stop uh, stop spreading uh, any um, sp spray. So you know we we just want to assure everybody you know we've we've always prided ourselves on our couch and eye care experience. Um, you know we're we're still going to be providing a very thorough eye examination, still using our state of the art technology, um, but it is going to be a little bit different perhaps than you've had in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, we are certainly going to do our best uh, to continue um, providing a great experience for you guys, um, but at the same time, keeping you safe. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Dr. Voison. That was very thorough and excellent. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 it's, it's evolving and it's changing. And, uh, you know, really one of the key things that we're doing at Couch and Eye Care is bringing back our staff uh, team before we get set up just to educate them on our uh, pandemic protection plan. Um, we know that some of the staff we brought back, there's a little anxiety because they're nervous about catching the virus, um, but uh, we're educating everybody and, and that anxiety is there amongst the whole population. And I just wanted to ask a poll question uh, to our attendees, you know, uh, and Ronnie, you can put this up, you know, what level of anxiety are you feeling right now at this stage of the pandemic? Are you feeling, and this is compared to, I guess, pre-pandemic, um, are you more anxious? Are you less anxious because you're having more relaxed time? I've, I've heard that, you know, it's everything's kind of quieted down and you're, you're doing, spending time with your family or you feel about the same. Um, so feel free to, to, to use this technology to give us uh, your answer. Um, this is one of the cool things on a, a side note of, of Zoom, you can, really engage the audience and, and see where they're at. Um, so it looks like, uh, uh, you know, the, the polls coming in here and, um, you know, uh, there's a mix uh, here. Uh, some people feeling about the same, which is fantastic. A nice and chill on in the couch and Valley. Uh, I would say personally, you know, I, I certainly started out feeling much more anxious um, having to lay off a number of our staff and close our locations uh, that was really challenging uh, as well. So, um, and I think, you know, I wanted to ask Dr. Malaysen uh, in a minute uh, about this so you can start uh, formulating your thoughts, but uh, you know, the, the mental um, burden on individuals and, 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 and staff and, and just people in general, are you go are expecting to see more challenges uh, on wellness and mental illness uh, going forward, uh, Dr. Bell and, uh, and and how do you, how do you think that's going to play out? Uh, let's answer that one uh, for you, Bill. Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, in general, there's just an elevated level of angst amongst uh, uh, folks in general, uh, whether they're you know feel at risk of catching this themselves. What's going to happen to me if I catch it? Uh, worried about loved ones. Uh, worried about uh, family members that are vulnerable. Uh, so there, there's that level of worry. Um, and then there's also the, the isolation side of it. Uh, people who are already uh, predisposed or struggling with mental health issues, uh, this seems to be um, uh, compounding that to some degree. So, um, you know, we are uh, uh, trying to mitigate that as best as we can. Um, there's a lot of self-care tools there. We, we are, you know, reaching out to our vulnerable populations as well, trying to identify them through our database and, uh, and making calls to, to see, check in with people. Um, so, you know, self-care is really important. And, and uh, what that looks like is, is, you know, trying to get out and, and do something physical if you're able. 
you know, of course, keeping in mind social distancing. Um, and, um, you know, still aspects of proper nutrition and uh, trying to uh, become less isolated socially, uh, even though we're trying to stay distant, as uh, Dr. Miranda has titled this, um, you know, we, we still reach out. I, you know, I, I, even myself, we're, we're all vulnerable to this. And, and after a couple of weeks of this, I tell you, um, we had a happy hour Zoom meeting on a Friday night. Had a beer and uh, saw some of our my buddies, including Dr. Miranda, and I tell you that uh, elevated my mood to such a great degree, just to be able to to sort of connect again. So social connectedness, I think, is probably one of the key parts in helping uh, deal with uh, the mental health issues. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Bell. I, I I really think we should have called it physical distancing rather than social distancing, and and uh, you know everybody could really. Uh, rally around that rather than the social aspect. I, I really encourage everybody to still be social, still say hello yeah. and, and be that warm land in the couch valley uh, that we have. So, so thanks for that answer. Uh, I wanted to pivot to um, what you see the future being uh, in, 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 uh, in dealing with this pandemic. Is there gonna be a second wave? Um, how, how, how's it going to play out if, if the caseload goes up or we're going to have to go back to shutdown? Uh, what, what are, I know, uh, can't predict the future, but, uh, in your, um, uh, your thoughts, uh, Dr. Malaysian, what do you think? How, 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 how's this going to play out? Yeah. Uh, good question. I mean, full disclosure, I'm, I'm a family doctor. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not an infectious disease specialist. Um, however, uh, you know, listening to those experts, um, you know, as we start to, uh, reduce some of the, um, um, restrictions that we're under, uh, we're, we're watching for that uptick, you know, those, those that are uh, the epidemiologists, they're, they're keeping an eye to see that we don't uh, go too far, uh, because that is the risk. And, uh, you know, we learned from the, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, the first wave was big, but the second wave was huge. And, and actually that came about because people uh, relaxed too much, gave up the social distancing and the second wave was huge. So, I mean, I think we're well aware of that. Um, hopefully we won't uh, see a second wave and hopefully, you know, you know we're gonna um, sort of keep uh, the, the curve flat. Perfect, perfect. Um, well, I wondered what your thoughts are. This is a question from one of our uh, attendees on, uh, you know, everybody's got a different standard of what uh, physical distancing, social distancing is. And, and some of those, uh, uh, one of our attendees said her young daughter in, uh, in the service industry gets yelled at uh, potentially by people who are, are, are really concerned about uh, the physical distancing. So um, I think it's really important uh, that, that we, we reserve judgment a little bit uh, as, as well. Uh, everybody's circumstance may be a little bit different. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, how, what do you think, Bill, on, on, that, uh, on that front where, you know, other people are commenting on how physically distant someone else is? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Henry is, is great. And when she speaks to this, um, that, you know, it, it's important that we be kind to everybody and, uh, you know, a, a little brush close to somebody for a brief moment is really not going to increase, increase your risk. You know, um, by and large, people are very courteous, you know, on the hiking trails and whatnot, and everybody seems to get it, but, 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 you know, I, I think we're not, we're not police. We're not there to be police of other people's behavior. You know, we just uh, try to be respectful. We don't know where that person's coming from, what their situation is. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we just try to be kind uh, to people. Yeah, great. And, and how do you feel, are we going to be broadening the circle, the bubble families? I know on one of the Eastern provinces is talking about bubble families, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, so can we just like have our golfing buddies in a bubble family? I, I wonder if that awesome. will fly with my wife. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think uh, as restrictions release, you know, there'll probably be some 
you know, restrictions of the bubble, but, you know, this is going to be with us. Uh, a lot of these restrictions are really going to be with us for the summer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, can the virus live on tennis balls? The way you hit it, Mike, yes, probably for a long time. But uh, <laughs> what, what do you think about that? Can the uh, virus live on tennis balls? Uh, you're asking me? Drew? Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is a data out there about you know how long the virus uh, lives on various surfaces. Um, you know, even like things like cardboard could be 24 hours. You know, uh, hard surfaces. Uh, you know, up to three days. Uh, tennis balls. I would uh, probably put in line with like the cardboard. Uh, so I would say probably yes. Although I don't have any specific direct knowledge about that, I would say there's a chance it would live there for you know, a day perhaps. Yeah, and I think the key is, you know, washing your hands, not touching your face. If you're gonna play those sports, um, don't, you know, touch your face and wash your hands after you play tennis. I mean, I think those are, you know, smart things to do as we go forward. I think the handshake is, 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 is gonna be gone for a while um, in, in, in terms of how we greet you. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out, do I do this or do I do this? You know, we gotta get our, uh, our, our little handshake together. Um, but yeah, you know, w w does that make sense, uh, Bill, sort of washing your hands after all activities, in between activities, that type of thing? Yeah, you know, I mean, a sort of a simple basic rule would be, you know, think every surface is contaminated and every person has the virus. So if you kind of just live your day-to-day -day like that, when you go around and touch something, you know, potentially it's on your hands. So, so hand washing is, is critical because hands lead to then face touching and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a key for sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I heard that, you know, washing your hands 20 seconds of really thorough washing is like putting on a new pair of gloves. It's, it's like a clean, don't get complacent about having gloves because you could contaminate your gloves, uh, quite, quite easily. So some people are going a little maybe overboard with the gloves. Yeah. Do you have comments on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Like uh, the gloves are like your hand. So if your gloved hand touches a surface as, a, as, as I mentioned before, I mean, anything you touch is now on your hand. So the glove is only good for that moment. And so if I'm seeing a patient, um, I'm seeing a patient with gloved hands, uh, but immediately the, uh, those gloves are off and uh, I'm washing my hands. So uh, yeah, I think um, it's just important to, you know, if you are choosing to use gloves, that's great. But it sometimes can give you a false sense of security and think that uh, you're immune while you're actually touching things uh, still that may be contaminated. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to transition uh, to what we're doing. You know, a lot of the technology we've implemented uh, because of the pandemic, I think will stay with us and, and optometry um, is moving forward, whether it's e-commerce, we're launching our, um, our e-commerce store in the near future. So the ability to interact with us, um, virtually will just grow. And uh, one of the reasons we did this uh, Zoom webinar, this webinar on Zoom is to be able to, you know, give a, a vehicle to educate the public and our patients uh, virtually as we go forward. So this is our first experiment. So we want to thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, let's just see if there's any other questions. Oh, here's a question from Alana. A lot of talk at the school level, the number of children allowed together in the school, um, it's, it's uh, sort of 15 at a time. Do you think, um, do you have any suggestions for uh, we can read on, on children as transmitters from, from children to adults? Uh, Dr. Bill, what do you think is going to happen at the school level? I think we'll find out more. I just talked to the principal at Francis Kelsey today. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to find out some more information. Do you have any uh, anything to share? Uh, well, we know children are really excellent vectors of viruses. And uh, they may not necessarily uh, show symptoms themselves, but you know they can bring that virus home and, and uh, to vulnerable populations like grandparents and uh, those that are uh, you know have higher risk. Um, so yeah, as far as uh, the school, I, I'm certainly going to be uh, having my ear to the ground and see what the provincial health officer is recommending and what the premier is going to announce. Um, but you know the idea of social distancing is still going to be part of uh, the school life moving forward, I think. 
Yeah, and I, I know, uh, you know, we have daughters that are in university age. Uh, what do you think? Are they going to head back to university or are they going to, they're going to be at home? I guess um, the moms will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our restaurant bill has gone down, but our, our grocery bill has gone way up. <laughs> but it's nice to have them home. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, that's looking forward to September. And, and really, uh, you know, we have to let the virus dictate uh, that rather than think we know how it's going to go. But I think schools are planning for students to be returning to university in September. Okay, yeah, great, thanks. We got a question here, anonymous. If I eat a burger with virus on it, do I get contaminated? <laughs> I must be hungry, but it makes me hungry. <laughs> Dinners later, not with virus, but just burger. Burger with a virus on it. Do I get contaminated, Dr. Bill? Yeah, so um, I, my understanding is that uh, food is not a, a vector for the virus. So I, uh, I don't think that there's a uh, concern about the food that we're eating or touching uh, causing uh, COVID-19. Yeah. And one more question. I'll, I'll, I'll get this. The question is, uh, you know, are we going to have this physical distancing with us until a vaccine is readily available? I would say, yes, Craig, that is going to be the case. Uh, or there's a therapeutic that really renders uh, this, this virus less, uh, less dangerous, less virulent uh, as we go forward. Anything to add to that, Bill? No, I think you nailed it there, really. Um, you know, there, there, there's global uh, charge to, to, to find the, uh, the, the um, vaccine. Pfizer announced, I think, yesterday that they are uh, starting human testing on a vaccine. Uh, but, you know, the vaccine, that's going to be the critical part. Uh, there's no guarantee that we're going to get a vaccine, but you know, that, that, you know, they're working hard on it. But vaccines have to be effective. But also, very importantly, they have to be safe. So they have to be, go through the proper testing. And then they have to be able to be mass produced. So th there's a, few, a number of hurdles. And any time, uh, you know, reach a hurdle doesn't mean we're going to get over it. But um, that is, I, I think, having a vaccine is going to be critical in, in um, you know, allowing us to get back to normal or the new normal. Right. And Chris wants to know, like, how many cases have there been actually in the Cowichan Valley? I don't have a, a good, a specific answer, unfortunately, because that data is not shared. Um, you know, we put the question to uh, the provincial health officer, to our island health officer, and they they, um, they they don't share that particular information. I don't quite know why. I think it'd be nice to know. Um, you know, we, we know that we've had a number of cases. Um, I don't think we've had any deaths in the valley. There's only been four deaths on Vancouver Island. Um, uh, you know, I myself swabbed three positive uh, cases uh, in my parking lot. Um, so it's there, uh, but in really little numbers. Yeah, okay, well, perfect. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions out there that uh, you'd like uh, Dr. Mason, Dr. Voison, or myself to address? Uh, feel free to, to share that. I want to thank you again for, for joining us. Um, is there anything, uh, Dr. Voison, you would like to say or you'd like to add uh, to the mix here? Uh, no, just thank everybody for joining us this evening. And like I say, you know, we are we are available for your ocular emergencies currently, and we do look forward to the next few weeks when they're going to let us go back to routine care as well. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you a question? What, what what do you consider an ocular emergency? So good question. Um, so right now the, uh, you know, loss of, you know, anything that could potentially be loss of vision um, or loss of life is kind of the, the high criteria for that. So, you know, people, um, you know, other things that could be emergencies. Um, so sudden vision loss, sudden onset flashing floaters, those could be signs of retinal detachment. Um, so um, sudden onset double vision too. Um, sometimes we can sometimes do some of that assessment via virtual health, but double vision is certainly easier to assess in person. Um, uh, you know, if you people that have a high prescription that have broken their glasses and have no prescription, um, you know, if, if we can, we can fill a prescription that 
that they had from last year, but if we don't have a prescription to go from, then we need the men to measure their eyes, um, to measure their prescription. But, um, you know, foreign body, you know, we've, I've seen quite a few patients for foreign bodies, uh, lots more gardening going on with all the spare time and uh, woodworking and uh, shop work. So I've dug out a few pieces of metal and flipped eyelids and got, you know, dirt out from underneath the eyelids. Um, any so, eye from doing puzzles? So, yeah. <laughs> those, those, those would be the main things that, yeah. uh, that we've been seeing in the office. So, yeah. yeah and it, you know, a lot of the times we, we, we triage with telehealth and, mm -hmm. uh, yes. you know, iritis, for instance, we can't tell that without looking under the slip lamp. So mm -hmm. some, a lot of times we have to bring that patient in and determine what it is. Also, yeah, and then other times, you know, to reach, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to say we're encouraging patients to reach out and ask mm -hmm. us uh, mm -hmm. so we can determine if it is a, a, a yes. emergency. And, and he was really concerned that he couldn't see far away. Turns out he's just sort of a decompensating astigmat. So he basically needs glasses and that's his emergency. But in his mind, he was very concerned and that can lead to anxiety and other things. So we want to be able to address those if we need to. So it's a case by case situation. Um, we've got, we've had some, you know, very significant ocular emergencies during the shutdown and we've had some minor ones, but you know, to that particular patient, it's important. So uh, we want to encourage everybody to at least reach out and, and work with mm -hmm. us to determine if an in-office visit is, is indicated in, in, in that particular case. Mm -hmm. So great question. Yeah. Yeah. And we've, um, because sometimes two flashing lights can be a migraine. And, you know, even just by the history and talking to the patient, we, you know, what do they say about 70 to 80% of the time you can make a diagnosis based on the patient's history alone. So um, it's very, very helpful to, to, you know, have the patients call us if they're having concerns, talk to them about it, video conference if you need to. They can email us pictures of their eye as well. Like we, we all have a great high, most of us anyways, have a great high quality camera right in the palm of our hands these days. Um, so we've gotten some really good photos from patients and we can, you know, uh, you know, just by looking at the photograph, be able to know whether or not we need to see them in person or not. So, but yeah, yeah like, like Bill was saying, just having the patients, you know, reach out to us and um, and have that discussion to see what needs to happen is, is great. Yeah, we have questions about uh, a lot of the screen time. A lot of our kids are, are, are schooling online, Dr. Voison, and just wondered, um, you know, what about blue light protection? What about, uh, you know, computer vision syndrome? Do you have any comments uh, on how we can uh, help our, our, our kids uh, because they're spending, you know, my son's actually going to school online and then he's gaming afterwards. With yeah, him. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> not a good, not a good thing. Yeah. So, you know, we certainly do have, you know, screen guidelines and whatnot. That's, you know, we can, that's available to, for people. Um, you know, a couple of things because um, what we want to do is make sure that you are taking visual breaks from the screen. So we have our 20, 20, 20 rule. So every 20 minutes you take a 20 second break by looking 20 feet away to relax the focusing of the eyes. Um, the, uh, you know, the use of um, specialty lens coatings or filters um, to help block the blue light um, are available. Uh, you, you know, one of the important things too for young, for children um, is, you know, the, the possibility of you know, the, the, the jury's still out on can ex extensive reading and screen time potentially reduce, uh, increase the risk for nearsightedness development. So we want to balance uh, the screen time with a good amount of outdoor activity uh, still in these times. You know, we would like to see kids having at least one to two hours of outdoor time on a daily basis. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, probably more for adults than kids, but dry eye can be a big problem when we're spending so many hours in front of the computer screen. So um, we can, uh, there's blinking exercises that we can do to help improve our subconscious blinking. Um, of course, there's all sorts of, you know, lubrication dry eye products that can be used as well if you are suffering from dry eye. Um, but uh, yeah, trying to blink more fully and, um, uh, and, and, and again, taking those visual breaks uh, there's also um, uh, anti, not just the filters, but for some people, even just having that little slight prescription for focusing can be really helpful on the computer screen. Um, so just that very slight prescription uh, is sometimes a big benefit.
yeah, having an up-to-date prescription, right? If, if mm -hmm. you're not quite up-to-date, but that was very thorough. That was an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you finish top of your class, right? You're <laughs> good answers. That's awesome. That was fantastic. You know, um, Anita, back to back to the eyes. You know, when I'm wearing the mask, uh, and I sound like this. <laughs> it, you know, I get fogged up in my in my glasses and on my oculars. Uh, do you have any solution for for people that wear glasses that are getting fogged up uh, quite a bit? Is there anything out there? Yeah, so there are some specialty, so there's, there, there's a couple of things. There are specialty, sometimes the, um, there's special coatings uh, for the lens that can be a little bit more resistant to the fogging. There's also products that can be used. Um, there's one, uh, uh, there's one called cat crap. <laughs> I don't know where they came up with that name, but it's a solution that can be put on the lens and treated. Uh, and then there's also a new, it's going to be available next week, actually. Um, there's going to be a new, it's a, it's a wipe actually that can clean your glasses and it provides great anti-fog protection for up to a couple of days. Um, so we're going to be getting some of that into the office, I'm sure, um, and have that available for us. Um, for people with the masks that are needed, like for our, our healthcare workers that are needing to wear the masks, um, we're really hoping that, that these, this fog cleaner will be beneficial. Uh, there are some tips and tricks too with respect to kind of taping around the top of the mask to help prevent the, um, the breath from getting up into the um, underneath if we if the mask isn't fully fully sealing as it should um, and I think that's about it all I can think yeah, of. Uh, you know sometimes those bands right the bands uh, reduce that interaction uh, keeps that those glasses close on the safety glasses oh yeah, like yeah like tightening up the yes yeah, tightening yeah. up the seal yeah right um no that that that's really good um what was do we have any other questions uh, oh I you know one question here if i break my glasses is that an emergency you know what it can be actually because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you can't function at all if you can't see so we, we, we want to address that and help you through that if you break your glasses uh, during the shutdown we will help you uh, uh, to be able to see better so give us a call or, or, or let us know um, and we have various ways to uh, with ppe uh, to protect you know, that's the um, personal protective equipment to protect our, our, our team and, and yourself uh, when we're uh, fixing the glasses. So we can certainly do that. We've done a ton of that. Uh, we've got four clinics, but only one of them is open and that's our Duncan location in Beverly Corners. Uh, we're sort of funneling all our, uh, all of our uh, emergencies and, uh, you know, emergency repairs and such to Duncan. Uh, but like I say, we're crossing our fingers and hoping to be up and going uh, next week, but that that's pending what um, what uh, Dr. Henry and uh, uh, Premier Horgan say. So um, yeah, I want to uh, sort of start wrapping it up here. And uh, is there any uh, final comments, uh, Dr. Bill, that you want to make uh, to our uh, to our audience uh, before we uh, sign off for the night? Yeah, I I, um, I think uh, you know we have made as a community great gains and as a province uh, great gains in, in flattening the curve so i think for that we should be commended uh i, I think you know as we go forward and, and have some release of restrictions you know we we still need to be vigilant uh and um you know the, the i think a lot of the measures to protect ourselves are going to continue through the summer the hand washing, the avoiding touching your face, the staying at home if you're ill, social distancing, uh, you know, keeping our contacts, our bubble low, and, and visiting more outside than inside. Um, you know, these are the measures uh, that will continue to be safe. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to get through this uh, together. And, you know, there's been a lot of tremendous leadership in our province. And I, I have to, again, put out to Dr. Uh, Bonnie Henry, who's done a tremendous job. And I, I'll just leave you with her words. And we need to be kind and, you know, we need to stay calm and, and uh, stay safe as well. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dr. Bill. And uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, one question was, uh, why didn't we have uh, any any answers about the hearing aid side. I guess we'll have to do another webinar and invite my brother, Dr. Terrence Miranda. So, uh, sorry, I couldn't uh, answer that, though some people mistake uh, us for each other. So maybe I can pretend next time, but I didn't want to address the hearing aid side at all because um, we don't have Terrence um, or any of his team here with us. So maybe we'll do that 
uh, again later. And one final question, uh, Dr. Bell, should I wear a mask when I go to the grocery store? Should I wear a mask when I go to the grocery store? Yeah, so um, the current feeling is that if you're going to be in a situation where you cannot guarantee social distancing, uh, it's recommended that you wear a mask. And, and when you're wearing a mask, you're kind of wearing the mask to protect the people around you. Uh, you know, you may have, uh, so it'd be asymptomatic. You may have the virus and not know it uh, before symptoms develop. So you're basically trying to prevent spread to other people. And if other people are in similar situation wearing a mask, they're preventing spread to you. So um, I wear a mask when I go to the grocery store, uh, but uh, not, not in other situations. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. I, I never go to the grocery store. It's a <laughs> man up here. But um, yeah, just uh, as a side note to the, the question about uh, the hearing aids, uh, Terrence is available at his Cobble Hill location to, to phone and ask any questions. So uh, if there's something pressing, uh, please reach out to him. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us for our first town hall. I, I think this was a really cool format. And uh, Dr. Bill Malayson, thanks for coming out. I will... Uh, appreciate it and uh, I want to let you know that I will still uh, beat you at poker uh, this Friday but uh, I owe you one let's say but not at golf not at golf <laughs> oh, sure enough, sure enough. We, we, I'm gonna mute you and you're, you're gone <laughs> and uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Anita Voisin uh, thanks for coming and, and joining us uh, today really great insights uh, super smart and we appreciate it yeah and uh, and Veronica Brown our uh, She's a director of wellness and experience, and uh, she's on our team, uh, be well uh, physically and mentally, and protected uh, uh, during this time of COVID. Uh, so she's helping us with our PPE and everything involved. So I uh, want to thank you, Ronnie, for setting this up. And uh, we, uh, we're going to sign off now and uh, try to address, uh, we'll, we're going to record this. This is being recorded, and we'll, we'll, we'll send the link out on our, our Facebook uh, site and on our website. Uh, on YouTube. So uh, if you've got friends out there in the Couch and Valley that want to watch this, uh, we certainly welcome that. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great night. Uh, you know, be kind, uh, uh, be safe. And uh, there was one other. <laughs> but uh, just uh, take care of yourselves. And, uh, and, and, and we hope to see you in person very soon. Okay. Bye for now. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Thank you. Good evening.